Discover Canada: The Rights and Responsibilities of Citizenship. Study Guide. The Oath of Citizenship. I swear or affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors, and that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada. And fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen. Le serment de citoyenneté. Je jure, ou j'affirme solennellement, que je serai fidèle et porterai sincère allégeance à Sa Majesté, la Reine Elizabeth II, Reine du Canada, à ses héritiers et successeurs. Que j'observerai fidèlement les lois du Canada et que je remplirai loyalement mes obligations de citoyen canadien. Understanding the oath. In Canada, we profess our loyalty to a person who represents all Canadians, and not to a document such as a constitution, a banner such as a flag. Or a geopolitical entity such as a country, in our constitutional monarchy, these elements are encompassed by the sovereign, a queen or king. It is a remarkably simple yet powerful principle. Canada is personified by the sovereign, just as the sovereign is personified by Canada. Message to our readers: Welcome. It took courage to move to a new country. Your decision to apply for citizenship is another big step. You are becoming part of a great tradition that was built by generations of pioneers before you. Once you have met all the legal requirements, we hope to welcome you as a new citizen, with all the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. Canada has welcomed generations of newcomers to our shores to help us build a free, law-abiding, and prosperous society. For 400 years, settlers and immigrants have contributed to the diversity and richness of our country, which is built on a proud history and a strong identity. Canada is a constitutional monarchy, a parliamentary democracy, and a federal state. Canadians are bound together by a shared commitment to the rule of law, and to the institutions of parliamentary government. Canadians take pride in their identity and have made sacrifices to defend their way of life. By coming to Canada and taking this important step towards Canadian citizenship, you are helping to write the continuing story of Canada. Immigrants between the ages of 18 and 54 must have adequate knowledge of English or French in order to become Canadian citizens. You must also learn about voting procedures, Canada's history, symbols, democratic institutions, geography, and the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. Canadian citizens enjoy many rights. But Canadians also have responsibilities. They must obey Canada's laws and respect the rights and freedoms of others. This guide will help you prepare to become a Canadian citizen. Good luck. For information about citizenship and immigration Canada, visit our website at www.cic. gc.ca. Applying for citizenship. When you apply for citizenship, officials will check your status, verify that you are not prohibited from applying, and ensure that you meet the requirements. Your application may take several months. Please ensure that the call center always has your correct address while your application is being processed. Telephone numbers will be supplied at the conclusion of this audio guide. Caption: Images of citizens taking the oath. 
How to use this booklet to prepare for the citizenship test? This booklet will help you prepare for the citizenship test. You should study this guide, ask a friend or family member to help you practice answering questions about Canada, call a local school or school board, a college, a community center or a local organization that provides services to immigrants and ask for information on citizenship classes. Take English or French language classes which the Government of Canada offers free of charge. About the citizenship test. The citizenship test is usually a written test, but it could be an interview. You will be tested on two basic requirements for citizenship. One, knowledge of Canada and of the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. And two, adequate knowledge of English or French. Adult applicants 55 years of age and over do not need to write the citizenship test. The citizenship regulations provide information on how your ability to meet the knowledge of Canada requirement is determined. Information about these regulations will be provided later in this audio guide. All the citizenship test questions are based on the subject areas noted in the citizenship regulations, and all required information is provided in this study guide. After the test. If you pass the test and meet all the other requirements, you will receive a notice to appear to take the oath of citizenship. This document tells you the date, time, and place of your citizenship ceremony. At the ceremony, you will take the oath of citizenship, sign the oath form, and receive your Canadian citizenship certificate. If you do not pass the test, you will receive a notification indicating the next steps. You are encouraged to bring your family and friends to celebrate this occasion. Rights and Responsibilities of Citizenship Canadian citizens have rights and responsibilities. These come to us from our history, are secured by Canadian law, and reflect our shared traditions, identity, and values. Canadian law has several sources, including laws passed by Parliament and the provincial legislatures, English common law, the Civil Code of France, and the unwritten constitution that we have inherited from Great Britain. Together, these secure for Canadians an 800-year-old tradition of ordered liberty, which dates back to the signing of Magna Carta in 1215 in England also known as the Great Charter of Freedoms, including freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of thought, belief, opinion and expression, including freedom of speech and of the press, freedom of peaceful assembly, and freedom of association, habeas corpus, the right to challenge unlawful detention by the state, comes from English common law. The Constitution of Canada was amended in 1982 to entrench the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which begins with the words, Whereas Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. This phrase underlines the importance of religious traditions to Canadian society and the dignity and worth of the human person. The Charter attempts to summarize fundamental freedoms while also setting out additional rights. The most important of these include mobility rights. Canadians can live and work anywhere they choose in Canada, enter and leave the country freely, and apply for a passport. Aboriginal people's rights. The rights guaranteed in the Charter will not adversely affect any treaty or other rights or freedoms of Aboriginal peoples. 
official language rights, and minority language educational rights. French and English have equal status in Parliament and throughout the government. Multiculturalism, a fundamental characteristic of the Canadian heritage and identity. Canadians celebrate the gift of one another's presence and work hard to respect pluralism and live in harmony. Caption Image of Queen Elizabeth II proclaiming the amended constitution in Ottawa in 1982. The equality of women and men. In Canada, men and women are equal under the law. Canada's openness and generosity do not extend to barbaric cultural practices that tolerate spousal abuse, honor killings, female genital mutilation, forced marriage, or other gender-based violence. Those guilty of these crimes are severely punished under Canada's criminal laws. Citizenship Responsibilities in Canada, rights come with responsibilities. These include obeying the law. One of Canada's founding principles is the rule of law. Individuals and governments are regulated by laws and not by arbitrary actions. No person or group is above the law. Taking responsibility for oneself and one's family, getting a job, taking care of one's family, and working hard in keeping with one's abilities are important Canadian values. Work contributes to personal dignity and self-respect and to Canada's prosperity. Serving on a jury, when called to do so, you are legally required to serve. Serving on a jury is a privilege that makes the justice system work, as it depends on impartial juries made up of citizens. Voting in elections. The right to vote comes with the responsibility to vote in federal, provincial, or territorial and local elections. Helping others in the community. Millions of volunteers freely donate their time to help others without pay by helping people in need, assisting at your child's school, volunteering at a food bank or other charity, or encouraging newcomers to integrate. Volunteering is an excellent way to gain useful skills and develop friends and contacts. Protecting and enjoying our heritage and environment. Every citizen has a role to play in avoiding waste and pollution while protecting Canada's natural, cultural, and architectural heritage for future generations. Defending Canada. There is no compulsory military service in Canada. However, serving in the regular Canadian forces, Navy, Army, and Air Force is a noble way to contribute to Canada and an excellent career choice. More information can be obtained online from the Canadian Forces website at www.forces. Dot ca. You can serve in your local part-time Navy, Militia, and Air Reserves and gain valuable experience, skills, and contacts. Young people can learn discipline, responsibility, and skills by getting involved in the cadets. More information can be obtained online from the Canadian Cadet Organization's website at www.cadets.ca. You may also serve in the Coast Guard or emergency services in your community, such as a police force or fire department. By helping to protect your community, you follow in the footsteps of Canadians before you who made sacrifices in the service of our country. Who we are. Canada is known around the world as a strong and free country. Canadians are proud of their unique identity. We have inherited the oldest continuous constitutional tradition in the world. We are the only constitutional monarchy in North America. Our institutions uphold a commitment to peace, order and good government 
a key phrase in Canada's original constitutional document in 1867, the British North America Act. A belief in ordered liberty, enterprise, hard work, and fair play have enabled Canadians to build a prosperous society in a rugged environment from our Atlantic shores to the Pacific Ocean and to the Arctic Circle. So much so that poets and songwriters have hailed Canada as the Great Dominion. To understand what it means to be Canadian, it is important to know about our three founding peoples, Aboriginal, French, and British. Caption. Images of a Métis man from Alberta, of a Cree dancer, of Inuit children in a Calouette Nunavut, and of the Haida artist Bill Reed carving a totem pole. Aboriginal peoples. The ancestors of Aboriginal peoples are believed to have migrated from Asia many thousands of years ago. They were well established here long before explorers from Europe first came to North America. Diverse, vibrant First Nations cultures were rooted in religious beliefs about their relationship to the Creator, the natural environment, and each other. Aboriginal and treaty rights are in the Canadian Constitution. Territorial rights were first guaranteed through the Royal Proclamation of 1763 by King George III and established the basis for negotiating treaties with newcomers, treaties that were not always fully respected. From the 1800s until the 1980s, the federal government placed many Aboriginal children in residential schools to educate and assimilate them into mainstream Canadian culture. The schools were poorly funded and inflicted hardship on the students. Some were physically abused. Aboriginal languages and cultural practices were mostly prohibited. In 2008, Ottawa formally apologized to the former students. In today's Canada, Aboriginal peoples enjoyed renewed pride and confidence and have made significant achievements in agriculture, the environment, business, and the arts. Today, the term Aboriginal peoples refer to three distinct groups. Indian refers to all Aboriginal people who are not Inuit or Métis. In the 1970s, the term First Nations began to be used. Today, about half of First Nations people live on reserve land in about 600 communities, while the other half live off-reserve, mainly in urban centers. The Inuit, which means the people in the Inuktitut language, live in small, scattered communities across the Arctic. Their knowledge of the land, sea, and wildlife enabled them to adapt to one of the harshest environments on Earth. The Métis are a distinct people of mixed Aboriginal and European ancestry, the majority of whom live in the Prairie Provinces. They come from both French and English-speaking backgrounds and speak their own dialect, Michif. About 65% of the Aboriginal people are First Nations, while 30% are Métis and 4% Inuit. Unity in Diversity John Buchan, the first Baron Tweedsmuir, was a popular Governor General of Canada in 1935 to 1940. In a speech to the Canadian Club of Halifax in 1937, he noted that immigrant groups should retain their individuality and each make its contribution to the national character. Each could learn from the other, and while they cherish their own special loyalties and traditions, they cherish not less that new loyalty and tradition which springs from their union. The 15th Governor General is shown in blood Kainai First Nation headdress. Caption Images of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Montreal, Quebec. A Highland dancer in Maxville, Ontario. A family celebrating Fête Nationale in Gatineau, Quebec. And of an Acadian fiddler in Village of Grand Anse, New Brunswick. English and French. Canadian society today stems largely from the English-speaking and French-speaking Christian civilizations that were brought here from Europe by settlers. 
English and French define the reality of day-to-day -day life for most people and are the country's official languages. The federal government is required by law to provide services throughout Canada in English and French. Today there are 18 million Anglophones, people who speak English as a first language, and 7 million Francophones, people who speak French as their first language. While the majority of Francophones live in the province of Quebec, one million Francophones live in Ontario, New Brunswick and Manitoba, with a smaller presence in other provinces. New Brunswick is the only officially bilingual province. The Acadians are the descendants of French colonists who began settling in what are now the Maritime Provinces in 1604. Between 1755 and 1763, during the war between Britain and France, more than two-thirds of the Acadians were deported from their homeland. Despite this ordeal, known as the Great Upheaval, the Acadians survived and maintained their unique identity Today, Acadian culture is flourishing and is a lively part of French-speaking Canada. Quebecers are the people of Quebec, the vast majority French-speaking. Most are descendants of 8,500 French settlers from the 1600s and 1700s and maintain a unique identity, culture and language. The House of Commons recognized in 2006 that the Québécois form a nation within a united Canada. One million Anglo-Quebecers have a heritage of 250 years and form a vibrant part of the Quebec fabric. The basic way of life in English-speaking areas was established by hundreds of thousands of English, Welsh, Scottish and Irish settlers, soldiers and migrants from the 1600s to the 20th century. Generations of pioneers and builders of British origins, as well as other groups, invested and endured hardship in laying the foundations of our country. This helps explain why Anglophones, or English speakers, are generally referred to as English Canadians. Becoming Canadian Some Canadians immigrate from places where they have experienced warfare or conflict. Such experiences do not justify bringing to Canada violent, extreme, or hateful prejudices. In becoming Canadian, newcomers are expected to embrace democratic principles, such as the rule of law. Caption Images of the celebration of cultures in Edmonton, Alberta. Of Ismaili Muslims in the Calgary Stampede, Alberta. Of the Caribbean Cultural Festival in Toronto, Ontario of the Ukrainian Pizanka Festival in Vegreville, Alberta, of young Polish dancers in Oliver, British Columbia, and of the pipes and drums in Ottawa. Diversity in Canada. The majority of Canadians were born in this country and this has been true since the 1800s. However, Canada is often referred to as a land of immigrants because over the past 200 years millions of newcomers have helped to build and defend our way of life. Many ethnic and religious groups live and work in peace as proud Canadians. The largest groups are the English, French, Scottish, Irish, German, Italian, Chinese, Aboriginal, Ukrainian, Dutch, South Asian and Scandinavian. Since the 1970s, most immigrants have come from Asian countries. Non-official languages are widely spoken in Canadian homes. Chinese languages are the second most spoken at home after English in two of Canada's biggest cities. In Vancouver, 13% of the population speak Chinese languages at home. In Toronto, the number is 7%. The great majority of Canadians identify as Christians. The largest religious affiliation is Catholic, followed by various Protestant churches. The numbers of Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, and members of other religions, as well as people who state no religion, are also growing. In Canada, the state has traditionally partnered with faith communities to promote social welfare, harmony, and mutual respect, to provide schools and health care, 
to resettle refugees, and to uphold religious freedom, religious expression, and freedom of conscience. Canada's diversity includes gay and lesbian Canadians who enjoy the full protection of and equal treatment under the law, including access to civil marriage. Together, these diverse groups sharing a common Canadian identity make up today's multicultural society. Caption Images of Christmas in Gatineau Chinese Canadian War Veterans Notre Dame des Victoires in Quebec City and the Chinese New Year celebration in Vancouver. Image of Marjorie Turner Bailey with caption Olympian Marjorie Turner Bailey of Nova Scotia is a descendant of black loyalists, escaped slaves and freed men and women of African origin who in the 1780s fled to Canada from America where slavery remained legal until 1863. Canada's history Aboriginal peoples. When Europeans explored Canada, they found all regions occupied by native peoples they called Indians, because the first explorers thought they had reached the East Indies. The native people lived off the land, some by hunting and gathering, others by raising crops. The Huron Wendat of the Great Lake region, like the Iroquois, were farmers and hunters. The Cree and Dene of the Northwest were hunter-gatherers. The Sioux were nomadic, following the bison or buffalo herd. The Inuit lived off Arctic wildlife. West Coast natives preserved fish by drying and smoking. Warfare was common among Aboriginal groups as they competed for land, resources, and prestige. The arrival of the European traders, missionaries, soldiers, and colonists changed the native way of life forever. Large numbers of Aboriginals died of European diseases to which they lacked immunity. However, Aboriginals and Europeans formed strong economic, religious, and military bonds in the first 200 years of coexistence, which laid the foundations of Canada. Caption Image of an Indian encampment during fur trade era. The first Europeans. The Vikings from Iceland who colonized Greenland a thousand years ago also reached Labrador and the island of Newfoundland. The remains of their settlement, Lance au Meadow, are a world heritage site. European exploration began in earnest in 1497 with the expedition of John Cabot, who was the first to draw a map of Canada's east coast. Image of John Cabot with caption. John Cabot, an Italian immigrant to England, was the first to map Canada's Atlantic shore, setting foot on Newfoundland or Cape Breton Island in 1497 and claiming the new found land for England. English settlement did not begin until 1610. Exploring a River, Naming Canada Between 1534 and 1542, Jacques Cartier made three voyages across the Atlantic, claiming the land for King Francis I of France. Cartier heard two captured guides speak the Iroquoian word Anata, meaning village. By the 1550s, the name of Canada began appearing on maps. Image of Jacques Cartier with caption. Jacques Cartier was the first European to explore the St. Lawrence River and to set eyes on present-day Quebec City and Montreal. Royal New France In 1604, the first European settlement north of Florida was established by French explorers Pierre de Mont and Samuel de Champlain. First on St. Croix Island in present-day Maine, then at Port Royal in Acadia, present-day Nova Scotia. In 1608, Champlain built a fortress at what is now Quebec City. The colonists struggled against a harsh climate. Champlain allied the colony with the Algonquin, Montagné, and Huron, historic enemies of the Iroquois, a confederation of five, later six, First Nations who battled with the French settlements for a century. The French and the Iroquois made peace in 1701. 
The French and Aboriginal people collaborated in the vast fur trade economy driven by the demand for beaver pelts in Europe. Outstanding leaders like Jean Talon, Bishop Laval, and Count Frontenac built a French empire in North America that reached from Hudson Bay to the Gulf of Mexico. Image of Count Frontenac with caption. Count Frontenac refused to surrender Quebec to the English in 1690, saying, My only reply will be from the mouths of my cannons. Image of Pierre Lemoyne with caption. Pierre Lemoyne, Sieur d'Iberville, was a great hero of New France, winning many victories over the English from James Bay in the north to Navy in the Caribbean in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Struggle for a Continent In 1670, King Charles II of England granted the Hudson's Bay Company exclusive trading rights over the watershed draining into Hudson Bay. For the next hundred years, the company competed with Montreal-based traders. The skilled and courageous men who traveled by canoe were called voyageurs and coureurs des bois, and formed strong alliances with First Nations. English colonies along the Atlantic seaboard dating from the early 1600s eventually became richer and more populous than New France. In the 1700s, France and Great Britain battled for control of North America. In 1759, the British defeated the French in the Battle of the Plains of Abraham at Quebec City, marking the end of France's empire in America. The commanders of both armies, Brigadier James Wolfe and the Marquis de Montcalm, were killed leading their troops in battle. The Province of Quebec Following the war, Great Britain renamed the colony the Province of Quebec. The French-speaking Catholic people, known as Habitants or Canadiens, strove to preserve their way of life in the English-speaking Protestant-ruled British Empire. A Tradition of Accommodation To better govern the French Roman Catholic majority, the British Parliament passed the Quebec Act of 1774. One of the constitutional foundations of Canada, the Quebec Act, accommodated the principles of British institutions to the reality of the province. It allowed religious freedom for Catholics and permitted them to hold public office, a practice not then allowed in Britain. The Quebec Act restored French civil law while maintaining British criminal law. Image of Sir Guy Carleton with caption. Sir Guy Carleton, also called Lord Dorchester, as governor of Quebec, defended the rights of the Canadiens, defeated an American military invasion of Quebec in 1775, and supervised the Loyalist migration to Nova Scotia and Quebec in 1782 and 83. United Empire Loyalists In 1776, the thirteen British colonies to the south of Quebec declared independence and formed the United States. North America was again divided by war. More than 40,000 people loyal to the Crown, called Loyalists, fled the oppression of the American Revolution to settle in Nova Scotia and Quebec. Joseph Brandt led thousands of Loyalist Mohawk Indians into Canada. The Loyalists came from Dutch, German, British, Scandinavian, Aboriginal, and other origins, and from Presbyterian, Anglican, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Quaker, and Catholic religious backgrounds. About 3,000 black loyalists, freedmen, and slaves came north seeking a better life. In turn, in 1792, some black Nova Scotians who were given poor land moved on to establish Freetown, Sierra Leone, West Africa, a new British colony for freed slaves. The Beginnings of Democracy Democratic institutions developed gradually and peacefully. The first representative assembly was elected in Halifax, Nova Scotia in 1758. Prince Edward Island followed in 1773, New Brunswick in 1785. The Constitutional Act of 1791 divided the province of Quebec into Upper Canada, later Ontario, which was mainly Loyalist, 
Protestant and English-speaking and Lower Canada, later Quebec, heavily Catholic and French-speaking. The Act also granted to the Canadas, for the first time, legislative assemblies elected by the people. The name Canada also became official at this time and has been used ever since. The Atlantic colonies and the two Canadas were known collectively as British North America. Image of the Assembly of Lower Canada with caption. The first elected Assembly of Lower Canada in Quebec City debates whether to use both French and English. January the 21st, 1793. Abolition of Slavery. Slavery has existed all over the world, from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East to the Americas. The first movement to abolish the transatlantic slave trade emerged in the British Parliament in the late 1700s. In 1793, Upper Canada, led by Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe, a loyalist military officer, became the first province in the empire to move toward abolition. In 1807, the British Parliament prohibited the buying and selling of slaves, and in 1833 abolished slavery throughout the empire. Thousands of slaves escaped from the United States, followed the North Star, and settled in Canada via the Underground Railroad, a Christian anti-slavery network. Image of Lieutenant Colonel John Graves Simcoe with caption. Lieutenant Colonel John Graves Simcoe was Upper Canada's first Lieutenant Governor and founder of the City of York, now Toronto. Simcoe also made Upper Canada the first province in the British Empire to abolish slavery. Image of Mary Ann Shad Carey with caption. Mary Ann Shad Carey was an outspoken activist in the movement to abolish slavery in the USA. In 1853, she became the first woman publisher in Canada, helping to found and edit The Provincial Freeman, a weekly newspaper dedicated to anti-slavery, black immigration to Canada, temperance, urging people to drink less alcohol, and upholding British rule. A Growing Economy the first companies in Canada were formed during the French and British regimes and competed for the fur trade. The Hudson's Bay Company, with French, British, and Aboriginal employees, came to dominate the trade in the Northwest, from Fort Garry, now Winnipeg, and Fort Edmonton, to Fort Langley near Vancouver and Fort Victoria, trading posts that later became cities. The first financial institutions opened in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The Montreal Stock Exchange opened in 1832. For centuries, Canada's economy was based mainly on farming and on exporting natural resources such as fur, fish, and timber, transported by roads, lakes, rivers, and canals. The War of 1812 the fight for Canada. After the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte's fleet in the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, the Royal Navy ruled the waves. The British Empire, which included Canada, fought to resist Bonaparte's bid to dominate Europe. This led to American resentment at British interference with their shipping. Believing it would be easy to conquer Canada, the United States launched an invasion in June 1812. The Americans were mistaken. Canadian volunteers and First Nations, including Shawnee, led by Chief Tecumseh, supported British soldiers in Canada's defence. In July, Major General Sir Isaac Brock captured Detroit but was killed while defending against an American attack at Queenston Heights near Niagara Falls, a battle the Americans lost. In 1813, Lieutenant Colonel Charles de Salaberry and 460 soldiers, mostly French Canadian, turned back 4,000 American invaders at Chateau Gay, south of Montreal. In 1813, the Americans burned Government House and the Parliament buildings in York, now Toronto. In retaliation in 1814, Major General Robert Ross led an expedition from Nova Scotia that burned down the White House and other public buildings in Washington, D.C. 
Ross died in battle soon afterwards and was buried in Halifax with full military honors. By 1814, the American attempt to conquer Canada had failed. The British paid for a costly Canadian defense system, including the citadels at Halifax and Quebec City, the naval dry dock at Halifax and Fort Henry at Kingston, today popular historic sites. The present-day Canada-USA border is partly an outcome of the War of 1812, which ensured that Canada would remain independent of the United States. Image of a Royal Navy frigate with caption, HMS Shannon, a Royal Navy frigate, leads the captured USS Chesapeake into Halifax Harbor, 1813. There were also naval battles on the Great Lakes. Image of Brock and Tecumseh with caption, Major General Sir Isaac Brock and Chief Tecumseh, Together, British troops, First Nations, and Canadian volunteers defeated an American invasion in 1812-1814. Image of a militiaman with caption. French-Canadian militiaman helped defend Canada in the War of 1812. Image of the Duke of Wellington with caption. The Duke of Wellington sent some of his best soldiers to defend Canada in 1814. He then chose Bytown, Ottawa, as the end point of the Rideau Canal, part of a network of forts to prevent the USA from invading Canada again. Wellington, who defeated Napoleon in 1815, therefore played a direct role in founding the national capital. Image of Laura Secord with caption. In 1813, Laura Secord, pioneer wife and mother of five children, made a dangerous 19-mile or 30-kilometer journey on foot to warn Lieutenant James Fitzgibbon of a planned American attack. Her bravery contributed to victory at the Battle of Beaver Dams. She is recognized as a heroine to this day. Rebellions of 1837-1838 In the 1830s, reformers in Upper and Lower Canada believed that progress toward full democracy was too slow. Some believed Canada should adopt American Republican values or even try to join the United States. When armed rebellions occurred in 1837-1838 in the area outside Montreal and in Toronto, the rebels did not have enough public support to succeed. They were defeated by British troops and Canadian volunteers. A number of rebels were hanged or exiled. Some exiles later returned to Canada. Lord Durham, an English reformer sent to report on the rebellions, recommended that Upper and Lower Canada be merged and given responsible government. This meant that the ministers of the Crown must have the support of a majority of the elected representatives in order to govern. Controversially, Lord Durham also said that the quickest way for the Canadiens to achieve progress was to assimilate into English-speaking Protestant culture. This recommendation demonstrated a complete lack of understanding of French Canadians who sought to uphold the distinct identity of French Canada. Some reformers, including Sir Étienne Pachal Taché and Sir George Étienne Cartier, later became fathers of Confederation, as did a former member of the voluntary government militia in Upper Canada, Sir John A. Macdonald. Responsible Government in 1840, Upper and Lower Canada were united as the province of Canada. Reformers such as Sir Louis Hippolyte La Fontaine and Robert Baldwin, in parallel with Joseph Howe in Nova Scotia, worked with British governors toward responsible government. The first British North American colony to attain full responsible government was Nova Scotia in 1847-1848. In 1848-1849, the Governor of United Canada, Lord Elgin, with encouragement from London, introduced responsible government. This is the system that we have today. If the government loses a confidence vote in the Assembly, it must resign. La Fontaine, a champion of democracy and French language rights, became the first leader of a responsible government in the Canadas. 
Image of Sir Louis Hippolyte La Fontaine with caption. Sir Louis Hippolyte La Fontaine, a champion of French language rights, became the first head of a responsible government similar to a prime minister in Canada in 1849. Confederation. From 1864 to 1867, representatives of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and the province of Canada, with British support, worked together to establish a new country. These men are known as the Fathers of Confederation. They created two levels of government, federal and provincial. The old province of Canada was split into two new provinces, Ontario and Quebec which together with New Brunswick and Nova Scotia formed the new country called the Dominion of Canada. Each province would elect its own legislature and have control of such areas as education and health. The British Parliament passed the British North America Act in 1867. The Dominion of Canada was officially born on July 1st, 1867. Until 1982, July 1st was celebrated as Dominion Day to commemorate the day that Canada became a self-governing dominion. Today it is officially known as Canada Day. Image of the Fathers of Confederation with caption. The Fathers of Confederation established the Dominion of Canada on July 1st, 1867, the birth of the country that we know today. Image of Dominion of Canada, one dollar bill with caption. Dominion of Canada, one dollar bill. 1923, showing King George V, who assigned Canada's national colors, white and red, in 1921. The colors of our national flag today. Dominion from sea to sea. Sir Leonard Tilly, an elected official and father of Confederation from New Brunswick suggested the term Dominion of Canada in 1864. He was inspired by Psalm 72 in the Bible which refers to Dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This phrase embodied the vision of building a powerful, united, wealthy and free country that spanned a continent. The title was written into the Constitution was used officially for about a hundred years and remains part of our heritage today. Expansion of the Dominion The following list identifies when the provinces and territories became part of Canada. 1867, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. 1870, Manitoba and the Northwest Territories. 1871, British Columbia. 1873, Prince Edward Island. 1880, the Arctic Islands were transferred to the Northwest Territories. 1898, the Yukon Territory. 1905, Alberta and Saskatchewan. 1949, Newfoundland and Labrador. 1999, Nunavut. Did you know in the 1920s, some believed that the British West Indies, British territories in the Caribbean Sea, should become part of Canada. This did not occur, though Canada and Commonwealth Caribbean countries and territories enjoy close ties today. Canada's First Prime Minister In 1867, Sir John Alexander Macdonald a father of confederation became Canada's first prime minister. Born in Scotland on January 11, 1815, he came to Upper Canada as a child. He was a lawyer in Kingston, Ontario, a gifted politician and a colourful personality. Parliament has recognised January the 11th as Sir John A. Macdonald Day. His portrait is on the $10 bill. Caption Image of Sir John Macdonald Sir George Etienne Cartier was the key architect of Confederation from Quebec. A railway lawyer, Montrealer, close ally of Macdonald and patriotic Canadien, Cartier led Quebec into Confederation and helped negotiate the entry of the Northwest Territories, Manitoba and British Columbia into Canada. 
Challenge in the West When Canada took over the vast northwest region from the Hudson's Bay Company in 1869, the 12,000 Métis of the Red River were not consulted. In response, Louis Riel led an armed uprising and seized Fort Garry, the territorial capital. Canada's future was in jeopardy. How could the Dominion reach from sea to sea if it could not control the interior? Ottawa sent soldiers to retake Fort Garry in 1870. Riel fled to the United States and Canada established a new province, Manitoba. Riel was elected to Parliament but never took his seat. Later, as Métis and Indian rights were again threatened by westward settlement, a second rebellion in 1885 in present-day Saskatchewan led to Riel's trial and execution for high treason, a decision that was strongly opposed in Quebec. Riel is seen by many as a hero, a defender of Métis rights and the father of Manitoba. After the first Métis uprising, Prime Minister Macdonald established the Northwest Mounted Police in 1873 to pacify the West and assist in negotiations with the Indians. The Northwest Mounted Police founded Fort Calgary, Fort Macleod, and other centers that today are cities and towns. Regina became its headquarters. Today, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, or the Mounties, are the national police force and one of Canada's best-known symbols. Some of Canada's most colorful heroes, such as Major General Sir Sam Steele, came from the ranks of the Mounties. Image of Fort Garry in 1863 with caption. The flag of the Hudson's Bay Company flew over Western Canada for 200 years before Confederation. Image of Sir Sam Steele as a great frontier hero, mounted policeman, and soldier of the Queen. Image of Gabriel Dumont as part of the Métis resistance. Gabriel Dumont was the Métis' greatest military leader. A railway from sea to sea. British Columbia joined Canada in 1871 after Ottawa promised to build a railway to the west coast. On November 7, 1885, a powerful symbol of unity was completed when Donald Smith, Lord Strathcona, the Scottish-born director of the Canadian Pacific Railway, or CPR, drove the last spike. The project was financed by British and American investors and built by both European and Chinese labor. Afterwards, the Chinese were subject to discrimination, including the head tax, a race-based entry fee. The Government of Canada apologized in 2006 for this discriminatory policy. After many years of heroic work, the CPR's Ribbons of Steel fulfilled a national dream. Image of a train and crew members with caption. Members of the train crew pose with a westbound Pacific Express at the first crossing of the Illicilua River near Glacier in British Columbia in 1886. Image of a Chinese workers' camp on the CPR, Kamloops, in British Columbia in 1886. Moving westward, Canada's economy grew and became more industrialized during the economic boom of the 1890s and early 1900s. One million British and one million Americans immigrated to Canada at this time. Sir Wilfrid Laurier became the first French-Canadian Prime Minister since Confederation and encouraged immigration to the West. His portrait is on the $5 bill. The railway made it possible for immigrants, including 170,000 Ukrainians, 115,000 Poles, and tens of thousands from Germany, France, Norway, and Sweden to settle in the West before 1914 and develop a thriving agricultural sector. The First World War. Most Canadians were proud to be part of the British Empire. Over 7,000 volunteered to fight in the South African War from 1899 to 1902, popularly known as the Boer War, and over 260 died. In 1900, Canadians took part in the battles of Paardeburg, Horse Mountain, and Lillefontaine. 
victories that strengthened national pride in Canada. When Germany attacked Belgium and France in 1914 and Britain declared war, Ottawa formed the Canadian Expeditionary Force, later the Canadian Corps. More than 600,000 Canadians served in the war, most of them volunteers, out of a total population of 8 million. On the battlefield, the Canadians proved to be tough, innovative soldiers. Canada shared in the tragedy and triumph of the Western Front. The Canadian Corps captured Vimy Ridge in April 1917 with 10,000 killed or wounded, securing the Canadians' reputation for valor as the shock troops of the British Empire. One Canadian officer said, it was Canada from the Atlantic to the Pacific on parade. In those few minutes, I witnessed the birth of a nation. April 9th is celebrated as Vimy Day. Regrettably, from 1914 to 1920, Ottawa interned over 8,000 former Austro-Hungarian subjects, mainly Ukrainian men, as enemy aliens in 24 labor camps across Canada, even though Britain advised against the policy. In 1918, under the command of General Sir Arthur Currie, Canada's greatest soldier, the Canadian Corps advanced alongside the French and British Empire troops in the last hundred days. These included the victorious Battle of Amiens on August 8, 1918, which the Germans called the Black Day of the German Army, followed by Arras, Canal du Nord, Cambrai, and Mons. With Germany and Austria's surrender, the war ended in the armistice on November 11, 1918. In total, 60,000 Canadians were killed and 170,000 wounded. The war strengthened both national and imperial pride, particularly in English Canada. Captions Image of a Sergeant, Fort Garry Horse of the Canadian Expeditionary Force in 1916. Image of Sir Arthur Curry, a reserve officer, who became Canada's greatest soldier. Image of a cap badge with caption, Maple Leaf Cap Badge from the First World War. Canada's soldiers began using the maple leaf in the 1850s. Image of the Vimy Memorial with caption, The Vimy Memorial in France honors those who served and died in the Battle of Vimy Ridge on April 9, 1917, the first British victory of the First World War. Women get the vote. At the time of Confederation, the vote was limited to property-owning adult white males. This was common in most democratic countries at the time. The effort by women to achieve the right to vote is known as the women's suffrage movement. Its founder in Canada was Dr. Emily Stowe, the first Canadian woman to practice medicine in Canada. In 1916, Manitoba became the first province to grant voting rights to women. In 1917, thanks to the leadership of women such as Dr. Stowe and other suffragettes, the federal government of Sir Robert Borden gave women the right to vote in federal elections, first to nurses at the battlefront, then to women who were related to men in active wartime service. In 1918, most Canadian female citizens aged 21 and over were granted the right to vote in federal elections. In 1921, Agnes MacPhail, a farmer and teacher, became the first woman MP. Due to the work of Thérèse Casgrain and others, Quebec granted women the vote in 1940. Image of Agnes MacPhail. Image of a nurse with caption, more than 3,000 nurses, nicknamed Bluebirds, served in the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps, 2,500 of them overseas. Canadians remember the sacrifices of our veterans and brave fallen in all wars up to the present day in which Canadians took part each year on November 11th, Remembrance Day. Canadians wear the red poppy and observe a moment of silence at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month to honor the sacrifices 
of over a million brave men and women who have served and the 110,000 who have given their lives. Canadian Medical Officer Lieutenant Colonel John McRae composed the poem in Flanders Fields in 1915. It is often recited on Remembrance Day. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row that mark our place, and in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Caption Images of Canadian Soldiers Observing Remembrance Day Of a Remembrance Day poppy Of a Canadian War Veteran And of Scouts Holding a Remembrance Day Wreath Between the Wars after the First World War, the British Empire evolved into a free association of states known as the British Commonwealth of Nations. Canada remains a leading member of the Commonwealth to this day, together with other successor states of the Empire such as India, Australia, New Zealand, and several African and Caribbean countries. The Roaring Twenties were boom times with prosperity for businesses and low unemployment. The stock market crash of 1929, however, led to the Great Depression, or the Dirty Thirties. Unemployment reached 27% in 1933, and many businesses were wiped out. Farmers in Western Canada were hit hardest by low grain prices and a terrible drought. There was growing demand for the government to create a social safety net with minimum wages, a standard work week, and programs such as unemployment insurance. The Bank of Canada, a central bank to manage the money supply and bring stability to the financial system, was created in 1934. Immigration dropped and many refugees were turned away, including Jews trying to flee Nazi Germany in 1939. Caption. Image of Phil Edwards with caption. Phil Edwards was a Canadian track and field champion. Born in British Guyana, he won bronze medals for Canada in the 1928, 1932, and 1936 Olympics, then graduated from McGill University Medical School. He served as a captain in the Canadian Army during the Second World War, and as a Montreal doctor, became an expert in tropical diseases. The D-Day Invasion, June 6, 1944 In order to defeat Nazism and Fascism, the Allies invaded Nazi-occupied Europe. Canadians took part in the liberation of Italy in 1943 to 1944. In the epic invasion of Normandy in northern France on June 6, 1944, known as D-Day, 15,000 Canadian troops stormed and captured Juneau Beach from the German army, a great national achievement. Approximately one in ten Allied soldiers on D-Day was Canadian. The Canadian army liberated the Netherlands in 1944 to 1945 and helped force the German surrender of May 8, 1945, bringing to an end six years of war in Europe. Caption. Image of painting by Orville Fisher with caption in the Second World War, the Canadians captured Juneau Beach as part of the Allied invasion of Normandy on D-Day, June 6, 1944. The Second World War The Second World War began in 1939 when Adolf Hitler, the National Socialist Nazi dictator of Germany, invaded Poland and conquered much of Europe. Canada joined with its democratic allies in the fight to defeat tyranny 
by force of arms. More than one million Canadians and Newfoundlanders, at that time Newfoundland was a separate British entity, served in the Second World War out of a population of 11.5 million. This was a high proportion, and of these, 44,000 were killed. The Canadians fought bravely and suffered losses in the unsuccessful defense of Hong Kong in 1941 from attack by Imperial Japan and in a failed raid on Nazi-controlled Dieppe on the coast of France in 1942. The Royal Canadian Air Force took part in the Battle of Britain and provided a high proportion of Commonwealth air crew in bombers and fighter planes over Europe. Moreover, Canada contributed more to the Allied air effort than any other Commonwealth country, with over 130,000 Allied air crew trained in Canada under the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. The Royal Canadian Navy saw its finest hour in the Battle of the Atlantic, protecting convoys of merchant ships against German submarines. Canada's merchant navy helped to feed, clothe, and resupply Britain. At the end of the Second World War, Canada had the third largest navy in the world. In the Pacific War, Japan invaded the Aleutian Islands, attacked a lighthouse on Vancouver Island, launched fire balloons over BC and the prairies, and grossly maltreated Canadian prisoners of war captured at Hong Kong. Japan surrendered on August 14, 1945, the end of four years of war in the Pacific. Regrettably, the state of war and public opinion in BC led to the forcible relocation of Canadians of Japanese origin by the federal government and the sale of their property without compensation. This occurred even though the military and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police told Ottawa that they posed little danger to Canada. The government of Canada apologized in 1988 for wartime wrongs and compensated the victims. Modern Canada Trade and Economic Growth Post-war Canada enjoyed record prosperity and material progress. The world's restrictive trading policies in the Depression era were opened up by such treaties as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, now the World Trade Organization. The discovery of oil in Alberta in 1947 began Canada's modern energy industry. In 1951, for the first time, a majority of Canadians were able to afford adequate food, shelter, and clothing. Between 1945 and 1970, as Canada drew closer to the United States and other trading partners, the country enjoyed one of the strongest economies among industrialized nations. Today, Canadians enjoy one of the world's highest standards of living, maintained by the hard work of Canadians and by trade with other nations, in particular the United States. As prosperity grew, so did the ability to support social assistance programs. The Canada Health Act ensures common elements and a basic standard of coverage. Unemployment insurance, now called employment insurance, was introduced by the federal government in 1940. Old age security was devised as early as 1927 and the Canada and Quebec pension plans in 1965. Publicly funded education is provided by the provinces and territories. Captions Image of a medical researcher Image of Toronto with caption Toronto's business district is also Canada's financial capital. International engagement like Australia, New Zealand, and other countries, Canada developed its autonomy gradually with a capacity to make significant contributions internationally. The Cold War began when several liberated countries of Eastern Europe became part of a communist bloc controlled by the Soviet Union under the dictator Joseph Stalin. Canada joined with other democratic countries of the West to form the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, a military alliance, and with the United States in the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. Canada joined international organizations 
such as the United Nations or UN. It participated in the UN operation defending South Korea in the Korean War in 1950 to 1953, with 500 dead and 1,000 wounded. Canada has taken part in numerous UN peacekeeping missions in places as varied as Egypt, Cyprus, and Haiti, as well as in other international security operations, such as those in the former Yugoslavia and Afghanistan. Canada and Quebec. French-Canadian society and culture flourished in the post-war years. Quebec experienced an era of rapid change in the 1960s known as the Quiet Revolution. Many Quebecers sought to separate from Canada. In 1963, Parliament established the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. This led to the Official Languages Act of 1969, which guarantees French and English services in the federal government across Canada. In 1970, Canada helped found La Francophonie, an international association of French-speaking countries. The movement for Quebec sovereignty gained strength, but was defeated in a referendum in the province in 1980. After much negotiation in 1982, the constitution was amended without the agreement of Quebec. Though sovereignty was again defeated in a second referendum in 1995, the autonomy of Quebec within Canada remains a lively topic, part of the dynamic that continues to shape our country. A changing society. As social values changed over more than 50 years, Canada became a more flexible and open society. Many took advantage of expanding secondary and post-secondary educational opportunities, and a growing number of women entered the professional workforce. Most Canadians of Asian descent had in the past been denied the vote in federal and provincial elections. In 1948, the last of these, the Japanese Canadians, gained the right to vote. Aboriginal people were granted the vote in 1960. Today, every citizen over the age of 18 may vote. Canada welcomed thousands of refugees from communist oppression, including about 37,000 who escaped Soviet tyranny in Hungary in 1956. With the communist victory in the Vietnam War in 1975, many Vietnamese fled, including over 50,000 who sought refuge in Canada. The idea of multiculturalism as a result of 19th and 20th century immigration gained a new impetus. By the 1960s, one-third of Canadians had origins that were neither British nor French and took pride in preserving their distinct culture in the Canadian fabric. Today, diversity enriches Canadians' lives, particularly in our cities. Captions. Images of a Vietnamese Canadian parade and of an F-86 Sabre from the Royal Canadian Air Force. Arts and culture in Canada. Canadian artists have a long history of achievement in which Canadians take pride. Artists from all regions reflect and define our culture and forms of creative expression and have achieved greatness both at home and abroad. Canadians have made significant contributions to literature in English and in French. Novelists, poets, historians, educators and musicians have had a significant cultural impact. Men and women of letters included Stephen Leacock, Louis Aymon, Sir Charles G. D. Roberts, Pauline Johnson, Emile Nelligan, Robertson Davies, Margaret Lawrence, and Mordecai Richler. Musicians such as Sir Ernest Macmillan and Healy Willen won renown in Canada and abroad. Writers such as Joy Kagawa, Michael Ondaatje, and Rohinton Mystery have diversified Canada's literary experience. In the visual arts, Canada is historically perhaps best known for the Group of Seven, founded in 1920, who developed a style of painting to capture the rugged wilderness landscapes. Emily Carr painted the forests 
and Aboriginal artifacts of the West Coast. Les Automatistes of Quebec were pioneers of modern abstract art in the 1950s, most notably Jean-Paul Riepel. Quebec's Louis-Philippe Hébert was a celebrated sculptor of historical figures. Kenayuk Achivak pioneered modern Inuit art with etchings, prints, and soapstone sculptures. Canada has a long and respected performing arts history, with a network of regional theatres and world-renowned performing arts companies. The films of Denis Arcand have been popular in Quebec and across the country and have won international awards. Other noteworthy Canadian filmmakers include Norman Jewison and Atta Magoyan. Canadian television has had a popular following. Captions, images of Cirque du Soleil and of Tom Thompson's painting, The Jack Pine. Sports have flourished as all provinces and territories have produced amateur and professional star athletes and Olympic medal winners. Basketball was invented by Canadian James Naismith in 1891. Many major league sports boast Canadian talent and in the national sport of ice hockey, Canadian teams have dominated the world. In 1996, at the Olympic Summer Games, Donovan Bailey became a world record sprinter and double Olympic gold medalist. Chantal Petitclerc became a world champion wheelchair racer and Paralympic gold medalist. One of the greatest hockey players of all time, Wayne Gretzky, played for the Edmonton Oilers from 1979 to 1988. In 1980, Terry Fox, a British Columbian who lost his right leg to cancer at the age of 18, began a cross-country run, the Marathon of Hope, to raise money for cancer research. He became a hero to Canadians, while he did not finish the run and ultimately lost his battle with cancer. His legacy continues through yearly fundraising events in his name. In 1985, fellow British Columbian Rick Hansen circled the globe in a wheelchair to raise funds for spinal cord research. Canadian advances in science and technology are world-renowned and have changed the way the world communicates and does business. Marshall McLuhan and Harold Innes were pioneer thinkers. Science and research in Canada have won international recognition and attracted world-class students, academics and entrepreneurs engaged in medical research, telecommunications and other fields. Since 1989, the Canadian Space Agency and Canadian astronauts have participated in space exploration, often using the Canadian designed and built Canadarm. Gerhard Herzberg, a refugee from Nazi Germany, John Polanyi, Sidney Altman, Richard E. Taylor, Michael Smith, and Bertram Brockhaus were Nobel Prize winning scientists. Captions Images of Donovan Bailey, Chantal Petitclerc, Terry Fox, and Wayne Gretzky. Image of Mark Tewksbury with caption Mark Tewksbury, Olympic gold medalist and prominent activist for gay and lesbian Canadians. Image of Paul Henderson with caption. In 1972, Paul Henderson scored the winning goal for Canada in the Canada-Soviet Summit Series. This goal is often referred to as the goal heard around the world and is still remembered today as an important event in both sports and cultural history. Image of Catriona LeMay Doan with caption, Catriona LeMay Doan carries the flag after winning a gold medal in speed skating at the 2002 Olympic Winter Games. Image of a Canadian football game with caption, Canadian football is a popular game that differs in a number of ways from American football. Professional teams in the Canadian Football League, CFL, compete for the championship Grey Cup donated by Lord Grey, the Governor-General, in 1909. Great Canadian Discoveries and Inventions Canadians have made various discoveries and inventions. Some of the most famous are listed below. Alexander Graham Bell hit on the idea of the telephone at his summer house in Canada. 
Joseph Armand Bombardier invented the snowmobile, a lightweight winter vehicle. Sir Sanford Fleming invented the worldwide system of standard time zones. Matthew Evans and Henry Woodward together invented the first electric light bulb and later sold the patent to Thomas Edison, who more famously commercialized the light bulb. Reginald Fessenden contributed to the invention of radio, sending the first wireless voice message in the world. Dr. Wilder Penfield was a pioneering brain surgeon at McGill University in Montreal and was known as the greatest living Canadian. Dr. John A. Hopps invented the first cardiac pacemaker used today to save the lives of people with heart disorders. Spar Aerospace and the National Research Council invented the Canadarm, a robotic arm used in outer space. Mike Lazaratis and Jim Balsillie of Research in Motion, a wireless communications company known for its most famous invention, the BlackBerry. Caption. Image of Canadian scientific innovation at work with Canadarm 2. Image of Sir Frederick Banting with caption, Sir Frederick Banting of Toronto and Charles Best discovered insulin, a hormone to treat diabetes that has saved 16 million lives worldwide. Want to learn more about Canada's history? Visit a museum or national historic site. Through artifacts, works of art, stories, images and documents, museums explore the diverse events and accomplishments that formed Canada's history. Museums can be found in almost every city and town across Canada. National historic sites are located in all provinces and territories and include such diverse places as battlefields, archaeological sites, buildings and sacred spaces. To find a museum or national historic site in your community or region, visit the websites of the Virtual Museum of Canada and Parks Canada listed at the end of this guide. The prosperity and diversity of our country depend on all Canadians working together to face challenges of the future. In seeking to become a citizen, you are joining a country that with your active participation will continue to grow and thrive. How will you make your contribution to Canada? How Canadians Govern Themselves There are three key facts about Canada's system of government. Our country is a federal state, a parliamentary democracy, and a constitutional monarchy. Caption, image of Queen Elizabeth II during the opening of the Parliament in 1957. Image of the Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Federal State there are federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments in Canada. The responsibilities of the federal and provincial governments were defined in 1867 in the British North America Act, now known as the Constitution Act, 1867. In our federal state, the federal government takes responsibility for matters of national and international concern. These include defense, foreign policy, interprovincial trade and communications, currency, navigation, criminal law, and citizenship. The provinces are responsible for municipal government, education, health, natural resources, property and civil rights, and highways. The federal government and the provinces share jurisdiction over agriculture and immigration. Federalism allows different provinces to adopt policies tailored to their own populations, and gives provinces the flexibility to experiment with new ideas and policies. Every province has its own elected legislative assembly, like the House of Commons in Ottawa. The three northern territories, which have small populations, do not have the status of provinces, but their governments and assemblies carry out many of the same functions. Parliamentary Democracy In Canada's parliamentary democracy, the people elect members to the House of Commons in Ottawa and to the provincial and territorial legislatures. These representatives are responsible for passing laws, approving and monitoring expenditures, and keeping the government accountable. Cabinet ministers are responsible to the elected representatives, which means they must retain the confidence of the House and have to resign if they are defeated in a non-confidence vote. 
Parliament has three parts, the sovereign, a queen or king, the senate, and the house of commons. Provincial legislatures comprise the lieutenant governor and the elected assembly. In the federal government, the prime minister selects the cabinet ministers and is responsible for the operations and policy of the government. The House of Commons is the representative chamber made up of members of parliament elected by the people traditionally every four years. Senators are appointed by the Governor General on the advice of the Prime Minister and serve until age 75. Both the House of Commons and the Senate consider and review bills which are proposals for new laws. No bill can become law in Canada until it has been passed by both chambers and has received royal assent granted by the Governor General on behalf of the Sovereign. Living in a democracy, Canadian citizens have the right and the responsibility to participate in making decisions that affect them. It is important for Canadians aged 18 or more to participate in their democracy by voting in federal, provincial, or territorial and municipal elections. The following are the steps for the legislative process in Canada or how a bill becomes law. Step one is called first reading. The bill is considered read for the first time and is printed. Step two is called second reading. In this step, members debate the bill's principle. Step three is the committee stage. At this stage, committee members study the bill clause by clause. Step four is the report stage. At this stage, members can make other amendments to the bill. Step five is called the third reading. At this stage, members debate and vote on the bill. Step six is the Senate stage. The bill will follow a similar process in the Senate. Step seven is called Royal Assent. The bill receives Royal Assent after being passed by both houses. Constitutional Monarchy As a constitutional monarchy, Canada's head of state is a hereditary sovereign, a queen or king, who reigns in accordance with the Constitution the rule of law. The Sovereign is a part of Parliament, playing an important non-partisan role as the focus of citizenship and allegiance, most visibly during royal visits to Canada. Her Majesty is a symbol of Canadian sovereignty, a guardian of constitutional freedoms, and a reflection of our history. The Royal Family's example of lifelong service to the community is an encouragement for citizens to give their best to their country. As head of the Commonwealth, the Sovereign links Canada to 53 other nations that cooperate to advance social, economic, and cultural progress. Other constitutional monarchies include Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Spain, Thailand, Japan, Jordan, and Morocco. There is a clear distinction in Canada between the head of state, the Sovereign, and the head of government, the Prime Minister, who actually directs the governing of the country. The Sovereign is represented in Canada by the Governor-General, who is appointed by the Sovereign on the advice of the Prime Minister, usually for five years. In each of the ten provinces, the Sovereign is represented by the Lieutenant-Governor, who is appointed by the Governor-General on the advice of the Prime Minister, also normally for five years. The interplay between the three branches of governments, the Executive, Legislative and Judicial, which work together but also sometimes in creative tension, helps to secure the rights and freedoms of Canadians. Each provincial and territorial government has an elected legislature where provincial and territorial laws are passed. Depending on the province or territory, the members of the legislature are called members of the Legislative Assembly or MLAs, members of the National Assembly or MNAs, members of the Provincial Parliament, or MPPs, or members of the House of Assembly, or MHAs. In each province, the Premier has a role similar to that of the Prime Minister in the Federal Government, just as the Lieutenant Governor has a role similar to that of the Governor General. In the three territories, the Commissioner represents the Federal Government and plays a ceremonial role. Caption. Image of the Governor General David Johnston, Canada's 28th Governor General since the Confederation. Canada's System of Government Parliament is comprised of three elements. The Sovereign, who is represented in Canada by the Governor General, the Senate, which is appointed on the Prime Minister's recommendation, 
and the House of Commons, which is elected by voters. The three branches of government are the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. The executive branch consists of the prime minister and the cabinet. The legislative branch consists of the parliament. The judicial branch consists of the different levels of courts in Canada. At the highest level, there is the Supreme Court of Canada, which consists of nine judges that are appointed by the Governor General. The Federal Court of Canada and the Provincial Courts are also part of the judiciary. Federal Elections Canadians vote in elections for the people they want to represent them in the House of Commons. In each election, voters may re-elect the same members of the House of Commons or choose new ones. Members of the House of Commons are also known as Members of Parliament, or MPs. Under legislation passed by Parliament, federal elections must be held on the third Monday in October every four years following the most recent general election. The Prime Minister may ask the Governor-General to call an earlier election. Canada is divided into 308 electoral districts, also known as ridings or constituencies. An electoral district is a geographical area represented by a member of parliament, or MP. The citizens in each electoral district elect one MP who sits in the House of Commons to represent them as well as all Canadians. Canadian citizens who are 18 years old or older may run in a federal election. The people who run for office are called candidates. There can be many candidates in an electoral district. The people in each electoral district vote for the candidate and political party of their choice. The candidate who receives the most votes becomes the MP for that electoral district. Voting. One of the privileges of Canadian citizenship is the right to vote. You are eligible to vote in a federal election or cast a ballot in a federal referendum if you are a Canadian citizen and at least 18 years old on voting day and on the voters list. The voters list used during federal elections and referendums are produced from the National Register of Electors by a neutral agency of Parliament called Elections Canada. This is a permanent database of Canadian citizens 18 years of age or older who are qualified to vote in federal elections and referendums. Once an election has been called, Elections Canada mails a voter information card to each elector whose name is in the National Register of Electors. The card lists when and where you vote and the number to call if you require an interpreter or other special services. Even if you choose not to be listed in the National Register of Electors or do not receive a voter information card, you can still be added to the voters list at any time including on Election Day. To vote either on Election Day or at advanced polls, go to the polling station listed on your voter information card. Caption, image of the House of Commons chamber. Secret ballot. Canadian law secures the right to a secret ballot. This means that no one can watch you vote and no one should look at how you voted. You may choose to discuss how you voted with others, but no one, including family members, your employer or union representative, has the right to insist that you tell them how you voted. Immediately after the polling stations close, election officers count the ballots, and the results are announced on radio and television and in the newspapers. After an election. Ordinarily, after an election, the leader of the political party with the most seats in the House of Commons is invited by the Governor-General to form the government. After being appointed by the Governor-General, the leader of this party becomes the Prime Minister. If the party in power holds at least half of the seats in the House of Commons, this is called a majority government. If the party in power holds less than half of the seats in the House of Commons, this is called a minority government. The Prime Minister and the party in power run the government as long as they have the support or confidence of the majority of the MPs. When the House of Commons votes on a major issue such as the budget, this is considered a matter of confidence. If a majority of the members of the House of Commons vote against a major government decision, 
the party in power is defeated, which usually results in the Prime Minister asking the Governor General, on behalf of the Sovereign, to call an election. The Prime Minister chooses the Ministers of the Crown, most of them from among members of the House of Commons. Cabinet Ministers are responsible for running the Federal Government Departments. The Prime Minister and the Cabinet Ministers are called the Cabinet, and they make important decisions about how the country is governed. They prepare the budget and propose most new laws. Their decisions can be questioned by all members of the House of Commons. The opposition party, with the most members of the House of Commons, is the official opposition, or Her Majesty's loyal opposition. The role of opposition parties is to peacefully oppose or try to improve government proposals. There are three major political parties currently represented in the House of Commons, the Conservative Party, Liberal Party, and New Democratic Party. Caption, image of the House of Commons in session. Voting procedures during an election period. The following provides more information about voting in Canada. The voter information card. Electors whose information is in the National Register of Electors will receive a voter information card. This confirms that your name is on the voters list and states when and where you vote. If you do not receive a voter information card, call your local elections office to ensure that you are on the voters list. If you do not have the number, call Elections Canada in Ottawa at 1-800 463 6868. If you cannot or do not wish to vote on Election Day, you can vote at the advance polls or by special ballot. The dates and location are on your voter information card. On Election Day, go to your polling station. The location is on your voter information card. Bring this card and proof of your identity and address to the polling station. To mark your ballot, mark an X in the circle next to the name of the candidate of your choice. Your vote is secret. You will be invited to go behind the screen to mark your ballot. Once marked, fold it and present it to the poll officials. At the ballot box, the poll official will tear off the ballot number and give your ballot back to you to deposit in the ballot box. When the polls close, every ballot is counted and the results are made public. You can see the results on television or on the Elections Canada website, www.elections.ca. Other levels of government in Canada. Local or municipal government plays an important role in the lives of our citizens. Municipal governments usually have a council that passes laws, called bylaws, that affect only the local community. The council usually includes a mayor or a reeve and councillors or aldermen. Municipalities are normally responsible for urban or regional planning, streets and roads, sanitation such as garbage removal, snow removal, firefighting, ambulance and other emergency services, recreation facilities, public transit, and some local health and social services. Most major urban centers have municipal police forces. Provincial, territorial, and municipal elections are held by secret ballot, but the rules are not the same as those for federal elections. It is important to find out the rules for voting in provincial, territorial, and local elections so that you can exercise your right to vote. The First Nations have band chiefs and councillors who have major responsibilities on First Nations reserves, including housing, schools, and other services. There is a number of provincial, regional, and national Aboriginal organizations that are a voice for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in their relationships with the federal, provincial, and territorial governments. The following information will help you understand the differences between federal, provincial, and territorial and municipal levels of government. At the federal government level, 
The elected officials are called members of parliament, or MPs. Some responsibilities at this level of government include national defense, foreign policy, citizenship, policing, international trade, criminal justice, aboriginal affairs, immigration, agriculture, environment. Of these examples, immigration, agriculture, and the environment are shared responsibilities with the provincial or territorial level of government. At the provincial or territorial government level, the elected officials are called one of the following titles, depending on the province or territory. Members of the Legislative Assembly, or MLAs. Members of the National Assembly, or MNAs. Members of the Provincial Parliament, or MPPs. Or members of the House of Assembly, or MHAs. Some responsibilities at this level of government include education, health care, natural resources, highways, policing in Ontario and Quebec, property, and civil rights. At the municipal or local government level, the elected officials are called councillors or aldermen, and the senior elected official is called a mayor or reeve. Some responsibilities at this level of government include social and community health, recycling programs, transportation and utilities, snow removal, policing, firefighting, emergency services. Caption, image of the Provincial Assembly in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. How much do you know about your government? The following are some questions that you can use to test your knowledge about your government. At the federal government level, who is Canada's head of state? What is the name of the representative of the Queen of Canada, the Governor General? What is the name of the Prime Minister, the head of government? What is the name of the political party in power? What is the name of the leader of the opposition? What is the name of the party representing Her Majesty's loyal opposition? What are the names of the other opposition parties and leaders? Who is your Member of Parliament, or MP, in Ottawa? What is your federal electoral district called? At the provincial government level, who is the Lieutenant Governor, the representative of the Queen in your province? Who is your Premier or Head of Government? What is the name of the provincial party in power? What are the names of the provincial opposition parties and leaders? Who is your provincial representative? At the territorial government level, what is the name of the commissioner who represents the federal government in your territory? What is the name of the premier? What is the name of your territorial representative? At the municipal government level, what is the name of the municipality where you live? Who is the head of the municipal government, mayor or reeve? Caption, image of the Quebec City Hall, constructed in 1895 to 1896. The justice system. The Canadian justice system guarantees everyone due process under the law. Our judicial system is founded on the presumption of innocence in criminal matters, meaning everyone is innocent until proven guilty. Canada's legal system is based on a heritage that includes the rule of law, freedom under the law, democratic principles, and due process. Due process is the principle that the government must respect all of the legal rights a person is entitled to under the law. Canada is governed by an organized system of laws. These laws are the written rules intended to guide people in our society. They are made by elected representatives. The courts settle disputes and the police enforce the laws. The law in Canada applies to everyone, including judges, politicians, and the police. 
Our laws are intended to provide order in society and a peaceful way to settle disputes and to express the values and beliefs of Canadians. Caption. Image of the scales of justice from the Vancouver Law Courts with the caption, The blindfolded Lady Justice symbolizes the impartial manner in which our laws are administered, blind to all considerations but the facts. Caption. Image of a border guard with a sniffer dog inspecting the trunk of a car at the Canada-U.S. border. Courts. The Supreme Court of Canada is our country's highest court. The Federal Court of Canada deals with matters concerning the federal government. In most provinces, there is an appeal court and a trial court, sometimes called the Court of Queen's Bench or the Supreme Court. There are also provincial courts for lesser offenses, family courts, traffic courts, and small claims courts for civil cases involving small sums of money. Police. The police are there to keep people safe and to enforce the law. You can ask the police for help in all kinds of situations. If there's been an accident, if someone has stolen something from you, if you're a victim of assault, if you see a crime taking place, or if someone you know has gone missing. There are different types of police in Canada. There are provincial police forces in Ontario and Quebec, and municipal police departments in all provinces. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or RCMP, enforce federal laws throughout Canada and serve as the provincial police in all provinces and territories except Ontario and Quebec, as well as in some municipalities. Remember, the police are there to help you. You can also question the police about their service or conduct if you feel you need to. Almost all police forces in Canada have a process by which you can bring your concerns to the police and seek action. Getting legal help. Lawyers can help you with legal problems and act for you in court. If you cannot pay for a lawyer, in most communities there are legal aid services available free of charge or at a low cost. Captions. Image of jury benches. Image of a police constable helping a young boy. Image of a prison with caption Prisons have an essential role in punishing criminals and deterring crime. Canadian Symbols Canada has many important symbols, objects, events, and people that have special meaning. Together, they help explain what it means to be Canadian and express our national identity. Important Canadian symbols have been discussed throughout this booklet. The Canadian Crown the crown has been a symbol of the state in Canada for 400 years. Canada has been a constitutional monarchy in its own right since Confederation in 1867 during Queen Victoria's reign. Queen Elizabeth II, who has been Queen of Canada since 1952, marked her Golden Jubilee in 2002 and celebrates her Diamond Jubilee, or 60 years as sovereign, in 2012. The crown is a symbol of government, including parliament, the legislatures, the courts, police services, and the Canadian forces. Caption. Image of the mace of the House of Commons in Ottawa. Flags in Canada. A new Canadian flag was raised for the first time in 1965. The red-white-red pattern comes from the flag of the Royal Military College Kingston, founded in 1876. Red and white had been colours of France and England since the Middle Ages, and the national colours of Canada since 1921. The Union Jack is our official royal flag. The Canadian Red Ensign served as the Canadian flag for about 100 years. The provinces and territories also have flags that embody their distinct traditions. Captions. Image of the Canadian flag of 1965. 
Image of the Canadian Red Ensign with caption, the Canadian Red Ensign served as the national flag for a hundred years and has been carried officially by veterans since 2005. The Maple Leaf The Maple Leaf is Canada's best known symbol. Maple leaves were adopted as a symbol by French Canadians in the 1700s, have appeared on Canadian uniforms and insignia since the 1850s, and are carved into the headstones of our fallen soldiers buried overseas and in Canada. The Fleur de Lis It is said that the lily flower, Fleur de Lis, was adopted by the French king in the year 496. It became the symbol of French royalty for more than a thousand years, including the colony of New France. Revived at Confederation, the Fleur de Lis was included in the Canadian Red Ensign, in 1948, Quebec adopted its own flag, based on the cross and the fleur-de-lis. Coat of Arms and Motto As an expression of national pride after the First World War, Canada adopted an official coat of arms and a national motto, Amare Asquad Mare, which in Latin means from sea to sea. The arms contain symbols of England, France, Scotland and Ireland, as well as red maple leaves. Today the arms can be seen on dollar bills, government documents, and public buildings. Caption Image of the Royal Arms of Canada and of the Parliament Image of the Snowbirds with caption The Snowbirds are a Canadian icon. The image shows 431 Air Demonstration Squadron. Parliament Buildings the towers, arches, sculptures, and stained glass of the Parliament buildings embody the French, English, and Aboriginal traditions and the Gothic Revival architecture popular in the time of Queen Victoria. The buildings were completed in the 1860s. The centre block was destroyed by an accidental fire in 1916 and rebuilt in 1922. The library is the only part of the original building remaining. The Peace Tower was completed in 1927 in memory of the First World War. The memorial chamber within the tower contains the Books of Remembrance in which are written the names of soldiers, sailors and airmen who died serving Canada in wars or while on duty. The provincial legislatures are architectural treasures. The Quebec National Assembly is built in the French Second Empire style while the legislatures of the other provinces are Baroque, Romanesque, and Neoclassical, reflecting the Greco-Roman heritage of Western civilization in which democracy originated. Popular Sports Hockey is Canada's most popular spectator sport and is considered to be the national winter sport. Ice hockey was developed in Canada in the 1800s. The National Hockey League plays for the championship Stanley Cup, donated by Lord Stanley, the Governor General, in 1892. The Clarkson Cup, established in 2005 by Adrian Clarkson, the 26th Governor General, and the first of Asian origin, is awarded for women's hockey. Many young Canadians play hockey at school, in a hockey league, or on quiet streets, road hockey or street hockey, and are taken to the hockey rink by their parents. Canadian children have collected hockey cards for generations. Canadian football is the second most popular sport. Curling, an ice game introduced by Scottish pioneers, is popular. Lacrosse, an ancient sport first played by Aboriginals, is the official summer sport. Soccer has the most registered players of any game in Canada. Caption Image of the Montreal Canadiens, Stanley Cup champions in 1978. The Beaver. The Beaver was adopted centuries ago as a symbol of the Hudson's Bay Company. It became an emblem of the Saint-Jean-Baptiste Society, a French-Canadian patriotic association in 1834, and was also adopted by other groups. This industrious rodent can be seen on the five-cent coin, on the coats of arms of Saskatchewan and Alberta and of cities such as Montreal and Toronto. Caption Image of a Beaver 
Canada's official languages. English and French are the two official languages and are important symbols of identity. English speakers, Anglophones, and French speakers, Francophones, have lived together in partnership and creative tension for more than 300 years. You must have adequate knowledge of English or French to become a Canadian citizen. Adult applicants 55 years of age and over are exempted from this requirement. Parliament passed the Official Languages Act in 1969. It has three main objectives. Establish equality between French and English in Parliament, the Government of Canada, and institutions subject to the Act. Maintain and develop official language minority communities in Canada. And promote equality of French and English in Canadian society. Caption Image of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Ottawa. National Anthem. O Canada was proclaimed as the National Anthem in 1980. It was first sung in Quebec City in 1880. French and English Canadians sing different words to the National Anthem. O Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land, glorious and free. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O Canada, terre de nos aïeux, ton front est saint de fleurons glorieux. Car ton bras sait porter l'épée, il sait porter la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée des plus brillants exploits. Et ta valeur, de foi trompée, protégera nos foyers et nos droits. Protégera nos foyers et nos droits. Royal Anthem The Royal Anthem of Canada, God Save the Queen, or King can be played or sung on any occasion when Canadians wish to honour the Sovereign. God Save the Queen God save our gracious Queen, long live our noble Queen, God save the Queen. Send her victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign over us, God save the Queen. Dieu protège la Reine Dieu protège la Reine de sa main souveraine, Vive la Reine, qu'un règne glorieux, long et victorieux, ronde son peuple heureux. Vive la Reine. The Order of Canada and Other Honours All countries have ways to recognize outstanding citizens. Official awards are called honours, consisting of orders, decorations and medals. After using British honours for many years, Canada started its own honours system with the Order of Canada in 1967, the Centennial of Confederation. If you know of fellow citizens who you think are worthy of recognition, you are welcome to nominate them. Information on nominations for many of these honours can be found at www.gg.ca slash document dot ASPX question mark ID equals 70 question mark ampersand LAN equals ENG. Caption Image of Oscar Peterson with caption Jazz pianist Oscar Peterson receives the Order of Canada from Roland Michener, the 20th Governor General, in 1973. In the centre are Nora Michener and a portrait of Vincent Massey, the 18th Governor General. The Victoria Cross. The Victoria Cross, VC, is the highest honour available to Canadians and is awarded for the most conspicuous bravery, a daring or preeminent act of valour or self-sacrifice, or extreme devotion to duty in the presence of the enemy. The VC has been awarded to 96 Canadians since 1854. Six recipients are included below with their images. Then Lieutenant Alexander Roberts Dunn, 
born in present-day Toronto, served in the British Army in the charge of the Light Brigade at Balaclava, 1854, in the Crimean War, and was the first Canadian to be awarded the Victoria Cross. Able seaman William Hall of Horton, Nova Scotia, whose parents were American slaves, was the first black man to be awarded the VC for his role in the Siege of Lucknow during the Indian Rebellion of 1857. Corporal Philip Conowal, born in Ukraine, showed exceptional courage in the Battle of Hill 70 in 1917 and became the first member of the Canadian Corps not born in the British Empire to be awarded the VC. Flying Ace Captain Billy Bishop, born in Owen Sound, Ontario, earned the VC in the Royal Flying Corps during the First World War and was later an honorary air marshal of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Captain Paul Triquet of Cabano, Quebec, earned the VC leading his men and a handful of tanks in the attack on Casa Berardi in Italy in 1943 during the Second World War and was later a brigadier. Lieutenant Robert Hampton Gray, a Navy pilot born in Trail, BC, was killed while bombing and sinking a Japanese warship in August 1945, a few days before the end of the Second World War, and was the last Canadian to receive the VC to date. National Public Holidays and Other Important Dates The following are some national holidays and important dates in Canada. New Year's Day is January 1st. Sir John A. Macdonald Day is January 11th. Good Friday is the Friday immediately preceding Easter Sunday. Easter Monday is the Monday immediately following Easter Sunday. Vimy Day is April 9th. Victoria Day is the Monday preceding May 25th, which is the Sovereign's birthday. Fête Nationale is a holiday celebrated in Quebec on June 24th, which is the Feast of St. John the Baptist. Canada Day is July 1st. Labor Day is the first Monday of September. Thanksgiving Day is the second Monday of October. Remembrance Day is November 11th. Sir Wilfrid Laurier Day is November 20th. Christmas Day is December 25th. Boxing Day is December 26th. Canada's economy, a trading nation. Canada has always been a trading nation and commerce remains the engine of economic growth. As Canadians, we could not maintain our standard of living without engaging in trade with other nations. In 1988, Canada enacted free trade with the United States. Mexico became a partner in 1994 in the broader North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, with over 444 million people and over one trillion dollars in merchandise trade in 2008. Today, Canada has one of the ten largest economies in the world and is part of the G8 group of leading industrialized countries with the United States, Germany, the United Kingdom, Italy, France, Japan, and Russia. Canada's economy includes three main types of industries. Service industries provide thousands of different jobs in areas like transportation, education, healthcare, construction, banking, communications, retail services, tourism, and government. More than 75% of working Canadians now have jobs in service industries. Manufacturing industries make products to sell in Canada and around the world. Manufactured products include paper, high technology equipment, aerospace technology, automobiles, machinery, food, clothing, and many other goods. Our largest international trading partner is the United States. Natural resources industries include forestry, fishing, agriculture, mining, and energy. These industries have played an important part in the country's history and development. Today, the economy of many areas of the country still depends on developing natural resources, and a large percentage of Canada's exports are natural resources commodities. Caption. Images of a lumber truck, of oil pump jacks in Alberta, of Atlantic lobster, and of a hydroelectric dam on the Saguenay River, Quebec. Canada enjoys close relations with the United States, and each is the other's largest trading partner. Over three-quarters of Canadian exports are destined for the USA. 
In fact, we have the biggest bilateral trading relationship in the world. Integrated Canada-USA supply chains compete with the rest of the world. Canada exports billions of dollars worth of energy products, industrial goods, machinery, equipment, automotive, agricultural, fishing and forestry products, and consumer goods every year. Millions of Canadians and Americans cross every year and in safety what is traditionally known as the world's longest undefended border. At Blaine in the state of Washington, the Peace Arch, inscribed with the words, Children of a Common Mother and Brethren Dwelling Together in Unity, symbolizes our close ties and common interests. Caption. Images of a car assembly plant in Oakville, Ontario, of the Port of Vancouver, of a research laboratory, of Rim's Blackberry device, and of ice wine grapes in the Niagara region in Ontario. Canada's regions. Canada is the second largest country on earth, with 10 million square kilometers. Three oceans line Canada's frontiers, the Pacific Ocean in the west, the Atlantic Ocean in the east, and the Arctic Ocean to the north. Along the southern edge of Canada lies the Canada-United States boundary. Both Canada and the USA are committed to a safe, secure, and efficient frontier. The regions of Canada. Canada includes many different geographical areas and five distinct regions which are the Atlantic provinces, central Canada, the prairie provinces, the west coast, and the northern territories. The national capital. Ottawa, located on the Ottawa River, was chosen as the capital in 1857 by Queen Victoria, the great-great-grandmother of Queen Elizabeth II. Today it is Canada's fourth largest metropolitan area. The National Capital Region, 4,700 square kilometers surrounding Ottawa, preserves and enhances the area's built heritage and natural environment. Caption. Image of the Ottawa's Rideau Canal with caption, Ottawa's Rideau Canal, once a military waterway, is now a tourist attraction and winter skateway. Provinces and territories. Canada has ten provinces and three territories. Each province and territory has its own capital city. You should know the capital of your province or territory as well as that of Canada. Population. Canada has a population of about 34 million people. While the majority live in cities, Canadians also live in small towns, rural areas, and everywhere in between. Caption. Images of the Banff National Park in Alberta and of Peggy's Cove Harbour in Nova Scotia. The following list identifies the capital cities in each province and territory. In the Atlantic provinces, St. John's is the capital of Newfoundland and Labrador. Charlottetown is the capital of Prince Edward Island. Halifax is the capital of Nova Scotia. And Fredericton is the capital of New Brunswick. In central Canada, Quebec City is the capital of Quebec. Toronto is the capital of Ontario. In the Prairie provinces, Winnipeg is the capital of Manitoba. Regina is the capital of Saskatchewan and Edmonton is the capital of Alberta. On the west coast, Victoria is the capital of British Columbia. In the northern territories, Iqaluit is the capital of Nunavut. Yellowknife is the capital of the Northwest Territories, and Whitehorse is the capital of the Yukon Territory. The Atlantic Provinces Atlantic Canada's coasts and natural resources, including fishing, farming, forestry and mining, have made these provinces an important part of Canada's history and development. The Atlantic Ocean brings cool winters and cool humid summers. Newfoundland and Labrador Newfoundland and Labrador is the most easterly point in North America and has its own time zone. In addition to its natural beauty, the province has a unique heritage linked to the sea. The oldest colony of the British Empire and a strategic prize in Canada's early history, the province has long been known for its fisheries, coastal fishing villages and distinct culture. Today, offshore oil and gas extraction contributes a substantial part of the economy. Labrador also has immense hydroelectric resources. Prince Edward Island Prince Edward Island, PEI, is the smallest province, known for its beaches, red soil and agriculture, especially potatoes. PEI is the birthplace of Confederation, connected to mainland Canada by one of the longest continuous multi-span bridges in the world, the Confederation Bridge. Anne of Green Gables, set in PEI by Lucy Maud Montgomery, is a much-loved story about the adventures of a little red-headed orphan girl. Nova Scotia Nova Scotia is the most populous Atlantic province. 
with a rich history as the gateway to Canada. Known for the world's highest tides in the Bay of Fundy, the province's identity is linked to shipbuilding, fisheries and shipping. As Canada's largest east coast port, deep water and ice free, the capital Halifax has played an important role in Atlantic trade and defence and is home to Canada's largest naval base. Nova Scotia has a long history of coal mining, forestry and agriculture. Today there is also offshore oil and gas exploration. The province's Celtic and Gaelic traditions sustain a vibrant culture. Nova Scotia is home to over 700 annual festivals, including the spectacular military tattoo in Halifax. New Brunswick. Situated in the Appalachian Range, the province was founded by the United Empire Loyalists and has the second largest river system on North America's Atlantic coastline, the St. John River System. Forestry, agriculture, fisheries, mining, food processing and tourism are the principal industries. St. John is the largest city, port and manufacturing centre. Moncton is the principal Francophone Acadian centre and Fredericton the historic capital. New Brunswick is the only officially bilingual province and about one-third of the population lives and works in French. The province's pioneer loyalist and French cultural heritage and history come alive in street festivals and traditional music. Central Canada more than half the people in Canada live in cities and towns near the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River in southern Quebec and Ontario, known as Central Canada, and the industrial and manufacturing heartland. Southern Ontario and Quebec have cold winters and warm, humid summers. Together, Ontario and Quebec produce more than three-quarters of all Canadian manufactured goods. Quebec. Nearly eight million people live in Quebec, the vast majority along or near the St. Lawrence River. More than three-quarters speak French as their first language. The resources of the Canadian Shield have helped Quebec to develop important industries, including forestry, energy and mining. Quebec is Canada's main producer of pulp and paper. The province's huge supply of fresh water has made it Canada's largest producer of hydroelectricity. Quebecers are leaders in cutting-edge industries such as pharmaceuticals and aeronautics. Quebec films, music, literary works and food have international stature especially in La Francophonie, an association of French-speaking nations. Montreal, Canada's second largest city and the second largest mainly French-speaking city in the world after Paris, is famous for its cultural diversity. Ontario. At more than 12 million, the people of Ontario make up more than one-third of Canadians. The large and culturally diverse population, natural resources and strategic location contribute to a vital economy. Toronto is the largest city in Canada and the country's main financial centre. Many people work in the service or manufacturing industries which produce a large percentage of Canada's exports. The Niagara region is known for its vineyards, wines and fruit crops. Ontario farmers raise dairy and beef cattle, poultry and vegetable and grain crops. Founded by United Empire Loyalists, Ontario also has the largest French-speaking population outside of Quebec, with a proud history of preserving their language and culture. There are five Great Lakes located between Ontario and the United States. Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan in the USA, and Lake Superior, the largest freshwater lake in the world. Prairie Provinces Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta are the prairie provinces, rich in energy resources and some of the most fertile farmland in the world. The region is mostly dry with cold winters and hot summers. Manitoba Manitoba's economy is based on agriculture, mining and hydroelectric power generation. The province's most populous city is Winnipeg, whose exchange district includes the most famous street intersection in Canada, Portage and Maine. Winnipeg's French Quarter, Saint Boniface, has Western Canada's largest Francophone community at 45,000 people. Manitoba is also an important centre of Ukrainian culture, with 14% reporting Ukrainian origins and the largest Aboriginal population of any province at over 15 percent. Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, once known as the breadbasket of the world and the wheat province, has 40 percent of the arable land in Canada and is the country's largest producer of grains and oil seeds. It also boasts the world's richest deposits of uranium and potash used in fertilizer and produces oil and natural gas. Regina, the capital, is home to the training academy of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Saskatoon, the largest city, is the headquarters of the mining industry and an important educational, research and technology centre. Alberta. 
Alberta is the most populous prairie province. The province and the world-famous Lake Louise in the Rocky Mountains were both named after Princess Louise Caroline Alberta, fourth daughter of Queen Victoria. Alberta has five national parks, including Banff National Park, established in 1885. The rugged badlands house some of the world's richest deposits of prehistoric fossils and dinosaur finds. Alberta is the largest producer of oil and gas, and the oil sands in the north are being developed as a major energy source. Alberta is also renowned for agriculture, especially for the vast cattle ranches that make Canada one of the world's major beef producers. The West Coast. British Columbia is known for its majestic mountains and as Canada's Pacific Gateway. The Port of Vancouver, Canada's largest and busiest, handles billions of dollars in goods traded around the world. Warm air streams from the Pacific Ocean gives the BC coast a temperate climate. British Columbia. British Columbia, or BC, on the Pacific coast is Canada's westernmost province, with a population of four million. The Port of Vancouver is our gateway to the Asia Pacific. About one half of all the goods produced in BC are forestry products, including lumber, newsprint, and pulp and paper products, the most valuable forestry industry in Canada. BC is also known for mining, fishing, and the fruit orchards and wine industry of the Okanagan Valley. BC has the most extensive park system in Canada, with approximately 600 provincial parks. The province's large Asian communities have made Chinese and Punjabi the most spoken languages in the cities after English. The capital, Victoria, is a tourist center and headquarters of the Navy's Pacific Fleet. The Northern Territories The Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and Yukon contain one-third of Canada's land mass but have a population of only 100,000 people. There are gold, lead, copper, diamond, and zinc mines. Oil and gas deposits are being developed. The North is often referred to as the land of the midnight sun because at the height of summer, daylight can last up to 24 hours. In the winter, the sun disappears and darkness sets in for three months. The Northern Territories have long, cold winters and short, cool summers. Much of the North is made up of tundra, the vast rocky Arctic plain. Because of the cold Arctic climate, there are no trees on the tundra and the soil is permanently frozen. Some continue to earn a living by hunting, fishing and trapping. Inuit art is sold throughout Canada and around the world. Yukon. Thousands of miners came to the Yukon during the gold rush of the 1890s, as celebrated in the poetry of Robert W. Service. Mining remains a significant part of the economy. The White Pass and Yukon Railway opened from Skagway in neighboring Alaska to the territorial capital, Whitehorse, in 1900 and provides a spectacular tourist excursion across precipitous passes and bridges. Yukon holds the record for the coldest temperature ever recorded in Canada, minus 63 degrees Celsius. Caption. Images of Mount Logan and Sir William Logan with caption. Mount Logan, located in the Yukon, is the highest mountain in Canada. It is named in honor of Sir William Logan, a world-famous geologist, born in Montreal in 1798 to Scottish immigrant parents. Logan founded and directed the Geological Survey of Canada from 1842 to 1869 and is considered one of Canada's greatest scientists. Northwest Territories The Northwest Territories, NWT, were originally made up in 1870 from Rupert's Land and the Northwestern Territory. The capital, Yellowknife, with a population of 20,000, is called the Diamond Capital of North America. More than half the population is Aboriginal. Dene, Inuit, and Métis. The Mackenzie River, at 4,200 kilometers, is the second longest river system in North America after the Mississippi and drains an area of 1.8 million square kilometers. Nunavut. Nunavut, meaning our land in Inuktitut, was established in 1999 from the eastern part of the Northwest Territories, including all of the former district of Kiwatin. The capital is Iqaluit, formerly Frobisher Bay, named after the English explorer Martin Frobisher, who penetrated the uncharted Arctic for Queen Elizabeth I in 1576. The 19-member Legislative Assembly chooses a premier and ministers by consensus. The population is about 85% Inuit, and Inuktitut is an official language and the first language in schools. Captions. Image of an Inuit boy in Nunavut. Image of a caribou with caption. The caribou, also called reindeer, is a popular game for hunters and a symbol of Canada's north. The Canadian Rangers. 
Canada's vast north brings security and sovereignty challenges. Dealing with harsh weather conditions in an isolated region, the Canadian Rangers, part of the Canadian Forces Reserves, militia, play a key role. Drawing on Indigenous knowledge and experience, the Rangers travel by snowmobile in the winter and all-terrain vehicles in the summer from Resolute to the magnetic North Pole and keep the flag flying in Canada's Arctic. Study questions. One of the basic requirements of citizenship is to demonstrate that you have adequate knowledge of Canada. The citizenship test is used to assess your knowledge of Canada and the rights and responsibilities of being a citizen in Canada. All the citizenship test questions are based on information provided in this study guide. You will be asked about facts and ideas presented in the guide. The following questions are similar to the questions that are found on the citizenship test. Use these questions to prepare for your test. All the answers can be found in this study guide. What are the three responsibilities of citizenship? A. Being loyal to Canada, recycling newspapers, serving in the Navy, Army, or Air Force. B. Obeying the law, taking responsibility for oneself and one's family, serving on a jury. C. Learning both official languages, voting in elections, belonging to a union. D. Buying Canadian products, owning your own business, using less water. The correct answer is B. Obeying the law taking responsibility for oneself and one's family, serving on a jury. What is the meaning of the Remembrance Day poppy? A. To remember our sovereign, Queen Elizabeth II. B. To celebrate Confederation. C. To honor Prime Ministers who have died. D to remember the sacrifice of Canadians who have served or died in wars up to the present day. The correct answer is D, to remember the sacrifice of Canadians who have served or died in wars up to the present day. 3. How are members of Parliament chosen? A. They are appointed by the United Nations. B. They are chosen by the provincial premiers. C. They are elected by voters in their local constituency or riding. D. They are elected by landowners and police chiefs. The correct answer is C. They are elected by voters in their local constituency or riding. Other study questions the following are some other study questions that you can use to prepare for the citizenship test. Name two key documents that contain our rights and freedoms. Identify four rights that Canadians enjoy. Name four fundamental freedoms that Canadians enjoy. What is meant by the equality of women and men? What are some examples of taking responsibility for yourself and your family? Who were the founding peoples of Canada? Who are the Métis? What does the word Inuit mean? What is meant by the term responsible government? Who was Sir Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine? What did the Canadian Pacific Railway symbolize? What does confederation mean? What is the significance of the discovery of insulin by Sir Frederick Banting and Charles Best? What does it mean to say that Canada is a constitutional monarchy? What are the three branches of government? What is the difference between the role of the Queen and that of the Prime Minister? What is the highest honor that Canadians can receive? When you go to vote on election day, what do you do? Who is entitled to vote in Canadian federal elections? 
In Canada, are you obliged to tell other people how you voted? After an election, which party forms the government? Who is your member of parliament? What are the three levels of government? What is the role of the courts in Canada? In Canada, are you allowed to question the police about their service or conduct? Name two Canadian symbols. What provinces are referred to as the Atlantic provinces? What is the capital of the province or territory that you live in? For more information about Canadian citizenship, you can obtain citizenship application information and take advantage of the many resources that are available by telephone. For all areas within Canada, the toll-free call centre number is 1-888-242-2100. Online. You can visit the Citizenship and Immigration website at www.cic.gc.ca. Discover Canada can be downloaded from this website. Citizenship classes. To obtain more information about citizenship classes, contact schools and colleges in your area. Go to your local library or community centre. Contact local settlement agencies or ethnocultural associations. For more information about Canada, ask a librarian to help you find books and videos about Canada. You could begin by asking for these books. The Canada Yearbook, published by Statistics Canada. Canada, a portrait published by Statistics Canada. How Canadians Govern Themselves by Eugene Forsey. It can be found online at the Library of Parliament at www.parl.gc.ca. The Canadian Encyclopedia, including the Youth Encyclopedia of Canada, www.thecanadianencyclopedia.com The Story of Canada Written by Janet Lunn and Christopher Moore Published by Leicester Publishing Limited Symbols of Canada Published by Canadian Heritage A Crown of Maples Published by Canadian Heritage Canada, a people's history. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Canada's History, published by Canada's National History Society. Kayak, Canada's History Magazine for Kids, published by Canada's National History Society. For more information about federal programs and services, you can obtain information about Canada by telephone or on the Internet. By telephone, call toll-free 1-800-O-CANADA, 1-800-622-6232, or 1-800-465-7735-TTY. Internet. The Government of Canada website contains information about many government programs and services. It can be found at www.canada.gc.ca. The following are other websites of interest that provide information on topics found in this guide. Websites about Canada. The Crown and Governor General. www dot gg dot ca Canadian Heritage www dot pch dot gc dot ca Atlas of Canada http colon backslash backslash 
atlas dot n r c a n dot g c dot c a backslash s i t e backslash index dot h t m l teachers and youth corner w w w dot c i c dot g c dot c a backslash english backslash games backslash index dot a s p parks canada w w w dot parks canada dot g c dot c a institute for canadian citizenship w w w dot i c c hyphen i c c dot c a the historica dominion institute w w w dot historica hyphen dominion dot c a the canadian experience a civic literacy project for the new mainstream www dot c d n experience dot c a websites about canadian history canadian confederation www dot collections canada dot g c dot c a backslash confederation backslash index hyphen e dot html confederation for kids www dot collections canada dot g c dot c a backslash confederation backslash kids backslash index hyphen e dot html first among equals the prime minister in canadian life and politics www dot collections canada dot g c dot c a backslash prime ministers virtual museum of canada www dot virtual museum dot c a canadian war museum www dot war museum dot c a canadian black history www dot c i c dot g c dot c a backslash english backslash games backslash museum backslash main dot a s p websites about military history and remembrance a day of remembrance w w w dot v a c hyphen a c c dot g c dot c a backslash content backslash history backslash other backslash remember backslash day remembrance dot pdf heroes and poppies an introduction to remembrance available in hard copy version only order at https colon backslash backslash cr orders hyphen command e s c s s dot v a c hyphen a c c dot g c dot c a backslash order dot p h p question mark m equal sign item underscore list ampersand c equal sign education kits canada remembers www dot v a c hyphen a c c dot g c 
dot ca backslash remembers backslash sub dot cfm question mark source equal sign history backslash info sheets historical booklets www dot vac hyphen acc dot gc dot ca backslash remembers backslash sub dot cfm question mark source equal sign history backslash series websites about government Parliament of Canada www dot p a r l dot g c dot c a I can vote www dot elections dot c a backslash content underscore youth dot a s p question mark section equal sign y t h ampersand d i r equal sign r e s backslash g e n backslash c a n ampersand document equal sign index ampersand l a n g equal sign e ampersand text only equal sign false canada's system of justice www.justice.gc.ca backslash eng backslash dept hyphen min backslash pub backslash just websites about geography geography quizzes http colon backslash backslash atlas dot n r c a n dot g c dot c a backslash site backslash english backslash learning resources backslash quizzes backslash index dot html websites about creating a greener canada sustainable development www dot pc dot gc dot ca backslash docs backslash pc backslash strat backslash sdd hyphen sds hyphen two zero zero seven backslash index underscore e dot a s p being energy efficient w w w dot n r c a n dot g c dot c a backslash e n e e n e backslash e f f e f f backslash index hyphen e n g dot PHP websites about getting involved
authorities. The following are the legal authorities under which Canada's citizenship program is administered. Section 5 of the Citizenship Act. Section 5. Subsidence citizenship to any person has an attribute of Canada and the responsibilities and privileges citizenship. Knowledge of Canada citizenship criteria. Section 15, subsection. A person is have an adequate knowledge of Canada. Questions prepared by the minister that they know the national symbols of Canada and have a general understanding of the following subjects. A. and military history. B, the characteristics of Canadian social and cultural history. C, political and political geography. D, characteristics of the Canadian government as a constitutional monarchy. Characteristics of Canada, other than those referred to in paragraphs A to B. Section 15, Section 2, is considered to have an adequate knowledge if they demonstrate, based on the responses to questions prepared by the that they have a general understanding of the following subjects. A. Participate B. Participation in Canadian society, including volunteerism, the environment, and the protection of heritage. C. Respect for the rights, freedoms, and obligations set out in the laws of Canada. And D. Of citizenship other than those referred to in paragraphs A. Memorable quotes. For Canada, I want the main, the granite, the main, the oak, and a among the nations of the world. Minister of Canada, 1896. Canadian, free to speak way, free to I think right, or free to choose to govern my country, to uphold for my and all mankind. Minister of Canada, first, 1953. These quotes do not need. The gold medal in hockey Olympics in Vegas.